Um, I was just going to say that I, my grandchildren keep telling me I'm too old to fall in love. But not long ago, my old friend, Charles Ruas, asked me out to dinner with his partner, Rob, and so I went, and who should be there but John Giorno, and I fell in love. <laughs> I mean, there's no other word for it. And so um, I had, of course, been keeping up with his work in varieties of ways over the years, but I never dreamed we would become friends and, and this event would happen. So I'm going to begin with a um, poem dedicated to him that I wrote very recently. And it's called Wide Steps Up. <clears throat> Thirty pointed huts, small fir trees, shifting scale of persons to surroundings. The white rocks shrink and grow gravely in the night. This earth cannot live without holy rites. Lots of hills to climb up and down, a straight ravine between the friars. Turn to the right and you will fall to the left. One pilgrim wears a beard down to his chest. But love hates coverings and prefers to be seen, and if despised, to melt away quickly. No gloss is allowed to weaken the bliss of scripture. And this poem is called Ambivalence. <clears throat> At the ninth hour, you want to be clear. If you're sleeping, don't wake up. At the ninth hour, it's always night, a few hours after four. <clears throat> Why did the names of seasons depress you that year? It was near the end, but not quite there. You had an hour to be happier on either side of Massachusetts Bay. But you were stricken at the word summer. I told you I couldn't turn around because I was going to Quincy, a place, not a season. The seasons are over. You have no land to leave to your children, not even a square the size of paper. That's why place names are saddening. Put them back in the drawer and return to Back Bay Station to the hour of your humiliation. Only when it's over can you give the blessing. <clears throat> Sorry for my cracking voice. And this is one that I wrote in London, probably um, four years ago, or, yes. It's called Going the Other Way. I was walking over Primrose Hill one damp summer night, bundles of white chestnut flared under the streetlights. London's unsteady skyline was not a reassuring one, but like a graph that measures markets and heartbeats. When one brain was weary, one heart was not. The brain can be shocked when all the air is gone, but the heart is slippery and needs a touch of spirit to nourish it. How am I still here at every thump? The heart has its needs and feelings sewn like threads into branches and seasons that we pencil as trees. The Irish women with brass-capped hair and tight mouths and a Muslim woman with five girls and one boy are all sadly clad at Victoria. In poverty, some screaming brats are fat and some are starved into silence on their father's laps. No father would be worse than that. What is created by humans is always alien the hissing buses and trains in Kentish Town, boys hunched in bunches on the lock, drugged and dirty and crushed, their eyes like lizards veiled and blind in retreat, while a man with a machete cut a fellow down, blood all over his hands, proud of being a killing kind of man. 
machete or his father's hand, which one caused this crime? The knots were grievous years for boys and men. Clouds of lard covered Kent's fields as the Eurostar raced away from London and Blake's spiritual son. William Blake used to walk on Primrose Hill, and it was there that he had the vision of two sons that he um, addressed, spoke to. <coughs> <coughs> This one is called Clouds. There's a softening to the bricks outside, and the thousand-mile storm is leaving where it's coming from, from the long ago to my abode. I'll sit at the window where it's safe to say no. I won't go out, I won't work for a living. I'll study the clouds becoming snow. Not with a spyglass, but with a wild guess, and only three words. You never know. Now I see others like me thinning into the least thing and drifting out like the frost of dust. Downstairs, cries of lust. Up here, a requiem mass and light to lead the clouds home to the past. All of us poor at last. <coughs> And this was a poem that I wrote to, um, in response to a poet, a Russian poet, who was part of the golden age at the turn of the century, last century, called I.F. Anensky. And he, um, somehow I got into his uh, way of thinking, even though it was horribly translated on, online. And so I wrote this to try to lift him up a bit. So the sky was yellow, then white snow followed. On a hand, an amethyst, a lilac in hospital light. Whose fault is it when no one visits? Last night I dreamed I was in a peaceful place, but woke up freezing and ashamed. On a side street in my sheets, my beloved passed as a shadow. Maddish, reddish, his fist clenched for a fight. I recalled his body color being soft like a child. Honey, I called, we were too late. God and the gods have moved away. Up, up, outside the jewel air, the sun motes and fire. A star is an amethyst, minus the poet. And then I had two shorter ones I wanted to read from an earlier book I wrote um, called The Lyrics, um, which is kind of a, um, a collection of walking poems. Um, <clears throat> Give me my shawl, my corkscrew, and my cloth bag. Give me my hot water bottle and my book. Give me my stick and my water. One shoe for walking and one to dance. No stability, thirst. The will to keep moving, an instrument's heat. Bald mountains and a spider that was a leaf. The scheme is organic, it knows itself. See that light across the enslaved sea. Redemption time knows when. And this one, uh, is number 13 in the set. If I were Jesus, would you slap both sides of my face? If I were Jesus, would you stamp on my hands? If I was Jesus, would you lock me up? Would you make me crawl down the prison hall? Would you cover my head, stick my face in a pot? Would you rape me? If I were Jesus, would you break down the door? Would you wreck the house and terrify my family? If I was Jesus, would you bomb my trees, my place of parables, the fig trees and the rivers of wheat? If I were Jesus, well, I'm not, so please go right ahead. <laughs> so, um, so um, this is the last poem I'll read, and it's not that long. <laughs> um, and I think it'll lead into John nicely. It's called The Shoes. 
And the quote at the beginning is from a wonderful Irish philosopher, very obscure, called Eriogena. And he said, the one who sees is the same as the one who runs. Stop in your tracks, take off your shoes, close your eyes. The word knows what to do, for the blind touching is seeing. Home in. The word is like a flood in shape and speed. You will like the way it runs east and west at the same time. Echoes and solidifies and breaks apart. It feels like a northern light, but it's the word. The word makes no sound. The word never made no sound and will not ever out of parched minds and tongues break this law. The word is not particles or waves or tangles. It runs all around. The word wrote itself and continues to write, stuffs the papyrus away in space, invisible ink, and yet it runs. It runs ahead of the mouth of the West. It meets itself running the other way. If you want to appear, turn to another. The word lives alone everywhere, lives as a pariah that only listeners will know by ear. The word doth say and attend only to this sad refrain, listen, we did our best. Our lives were saved, it wasn't fair. We had to let the animals die. The second to last came at dawn. He shoveled up the roots and burned them. There were about 100 boots from the soldiers who died in Iraq before and after, Turkey and Iran. They were dirty and curled at the toes. What should we do? What can we do? Take off your shoes. You've walked far enough. Take them off and feel the ground. You've come a long way against the sun. What's about to come? Crusty desert, stone-grown towns, barefoot children, not even a crown of thorns, salt rivers, snow-white animals dipping into them. The same names. We don't have a name for holy. We don't have a name for true. We don't have a name for God or Lord, but the word still holds. Will we row across a rubbery sea, vomiting, singing, fall falling over, losing our voices, our wits, our hearing? Will we be glad to die? If a shoe is lying on a highway, it indicates an accident. When two shoes are crossed, it means instability. When two shoes are lined up, it means a door. You will never see the face, but can guess the age. Sneak away, the race is ending. There might be a brighter night when stars slide forward and we disappear. Always hold both east and west and be sure to wear two shoes. Put your feet on the ground, Moses. Take off your hood. And what's that in your hand? My staff. Your coat? The sheep enjoy the smell. Take it off and throw it in the bin. Everything human is poisoned. You must burn, not bury one. In a man-made world, you can't buy wood. So thank you. <laughs>